What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Point Forward. Today, we are breaking down Victor Wimbanyama's first 50 games, which have been crazy. I didn't even realize that. Me neither. Evan is admitting that the Warriors have the trap back jumping. And we're talking about one of the greatest freshmen in the game. And lastly, we're tapping in with the one and only Kevin Herter. Don't hurt her. <laughs> Make sure y'all subscribe to Point Four wherever you listen to your podcast and feel free to rate and review us. Then follow us on all social channels at Point Forward. Point Forward is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. I just recently read an article from SB Nation written by Ricky O'Donnell where he goes in depth about Wimby's first 50 games Mm -hmm. and claims the NBA will never be the same as a result, you know, of his body of work thus far. In this article, he makes claims as to Wimby being a top 15 player already and at worst, second team all defense. Why he's a rookie. We've also seen LeBron's Instagram post paying homage to the young phenom as well. So... So he's definitely stamped and worth the discussion. Let's get to it. Right. So how you feel about that, Dre? Saying he's top 15 in the league already and at very least defensive player of the year. I mean, uh, second team all defense. And right now he's leading the league in blocks. Right. He's leading the league in total blocks despite playing hundreds of fewer minutes. Hundreds yeah. of fewer minutes yeah. than most of his competitors. So I will be honest. It's not that I – I just didn't see it because I didn't see it. Like, yeah, I didn't yeah, see much of him, so yeah, I didn't know what to expect. But I will be honest, when I started to watch him play and I paid attention to him, like when he was nutmeg somebody, he went yeah. behind the back and banged on somebody, and then his energy versus Shet, they were going on there, you know, that that you know that competitiveness about him. I, I became a fan, like, really fast, and I started rooting for him. That's when I knew I liked him. And just to see him on the court, be humble with his teammates. I think just the way he carries himself and then to see somebody with that type of competitive nature, like, uh, he's once he starts gaining weight and figures it out, like, to slow the game down, yeah, and if he gets a hook shot, it's really over with. I mean, shoot, even just with the threes, I mean, his right now he's the first player in history to record 75 threes, 150 assists, and 150 blocks in a se- single season. He's only at game 50. It's still 30-something more games. Which is pretty crazy, bro. I think one thing that occurred that we're uh, he's also stepped up on. Shout out to my guy Zach Collins, but you remember they were playing a big next to him, which was kind of forcing yeah. Wimby to shoot threes early on. That he wasn't really supposed to be shooting, so his percentage was kind of down. But now it's like he's playing under the rim. He's able to float around and got more dribblers, more shooters around him. The game is looking it's looking crazy. So I'm wondering, like, if you're sitting there, is he right to really say? You know, the NBA will never be the same. Who, who, you know, who's some of the rookies in the past where you thought, like, shit, this is, this is different Compar- comparably? I think we, we don't give enough credit to Dwight Howard. Because when I've been in the game and we came in at halftime and the coach said, why are y'all, why are you all acting so afraid of Dwight Howard? He's probably got 20 and 20. Joking. And when he grabbed the stat sheet, he said, give me the stat sheet. He's got 20 and 19. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget that. He was like, yo, I'm sick of, like, nobody, like, everybody's afraid of Dwight. Like, I'm sick of this. He was like, he, he said, he said, he probably got 20 and 20. Let me see the shot. The man had 20 and 19 at halftime. This is back then, E.T., because we always talk about the game is going to be, like, if we score more than 25 a quarter, like, like, hold a team under 25 or it's a problem. And for a guy to have 20 and 19 at halftime. And then you couldn't go in the paint. I remember Doug Collins was pissed at us. Like, what are y'all afraid of? Y'all won't go to the paint? Yeah, because that shit going to get sent right back out the paint. Yeah, it was real. And he, he was just, I mean, he took a team to the finals. And it was, you know, we saw Shaq. But it, we really didn't have too many bigs. And we started to phase out of the big man. Yeah. Like, Dwight's era the, 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 was the beginning of the big starting to get phased yeah. out. But Dwight kind of held it down. Where you had to have somebody 
to guard the white. And I think that's how the game has changed where we haven't had a dominant big, per se, that's making you guard him. Maybe Jokic, maybe, it could bring it back, but he's kind of like a center guard. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's a point center. But with Wimby, it's when he starts to fill out and he gets very comfortable with himself and he get likes mean, if, he, if Wimby ever gets mean, it's a it's gonna be a problem. Yeah, I think he got some some meanness to him. I think he's just, mm-hmm. he's still a pop. I, mm-hmm. I still think he got. You don't perform on that high stage. He's performed where on some pretty big stages where he shows up where it's got to be some type of toughness to him. Yeah. And then when he sees Chet Holmgren, they do everything but fight. <laughs> like you know what I mean when you sit there. And I'm wondering when you have that conversation between those two, it's like we say all these great things that Wemby has done, but Chet has been amazing in itself. So what do you think that rookie of the year race will be? And is it comparable to when the LeBron Carmelo thing occurred? Not saying the same stature, right. but in a sense of like... No, it's, it can be very yeah, similar. you got to argue with the coach. you got to argue, because yeah. I think Chet is on that level too. Of, yeah. I think in a year and a half or not, them, them Thunder are going to be in a, the Western Conference Finals. Man, like man, and and, and like, Shea is, and when they get Shea's to winning, got the torch. Yeah, and, and I think when you talk about a torch, and this is what's gonna be crazy. I told my man Tatum, I'm like, all right, now I like, get get it together because it's marketability. It ain't like it's some ugly <laughs> winning. Like, like you know what I mean? But like, I'm like, man, this nigga dress well, like good looking, like damn, and he finna win a chip. Yeah. And he a good dude. So I be telling Taylor, like, hey, beware, man. A dark skinned dude. It's like, shoot, Derek Luke, little brother, might get you. You know what I mean? You know what's funny, though? Will the new system disrupt the Oklahoma City Thunder? I think they're just thorough dudes, man. That's a that's a confident group of young. No, I'm talking about the, the, the aprons in terms of you got to retain on them guys. Yeah. I, to be honest with you, bro, I, I think it's almost like a college atmosphere over there. I think they comprehend. I think those dudes are super. It's not like a weird. This is a super comfortable group. Not even when you look at the like you pair it to the Lakers situation, when they had like D. Rush, Jordan Clarkson, Kuzma, like people that really had some type of notoriety. Like that was L. A. kind of playing a part in it, along with like different personalities. But these dudes are in OKC in like a college type atmosphere. But they, they win it. Yeah, and also, too, but they're bred in a different environment. I think what they were shown, like you always said back in the day, were like, yo, you can't build. You always argue when they brought up Sam Presti. Like, bro, building a team at OKC is way different than building a team in Philly For or sure. New York. Mm-hmm. Or, like, what a kid, his, 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 his distractions are going to be completely different naturally. I'm saying you, you think some guys are going to take less money? Bro, I don't know if they're gonna take. Bro, they just what's less money? Like one fifty and one twenty five. Like the niggas rich, rich. No, nah, no, nah, but you ain't you ain't leaving seventy, eighty on the table, uh, man. Go, so look, I don't know what they doing. Who own the Thunder? Go into that luxury, and when you go into a luxury, or fuck around and affect the environment, the economy, and maybe <laughs> they'll, they'll build a new school around that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Do that. I'm telling you, thank me. Name, let me be the mayor. But go into that luxury. I swear to God, bro, we'll have deep dish pizza and everything out that motherfucker. But make sure y'all go into a luxury. Do not let this team go. Dre, you got to, J. You got to. You got, bro, I, why else? After y'all trade away three MVPs, don't ever touch shit again. Do not touch shit again. Just assume you did a great job. <laughs> After what them fools did for Paul George... <laughs> <laughs> like the trade, like, like what you got for that? Just assume you did an amazing job. When you look back on the OKC days, dog, mm-hmm. shout out to Sam. But like, you should be fired for getting rid of all them niggas. Uh, I'm just saying, like, like oh, Harden. No, no, I understand what you're saying, but these, like, hard, yeah, like you were no, worried about. Just... And when we're talking about shout out to Surge, and I don't remember Surge, but like when you look at the game, like bro, James averaging 16 a game off the bench, yeah. dog, like with two of the top dogs. I'm just saying. I, I would hate to see it. You almost look at Brooklyn Nets and look at all their roster they had since 2019, 2020. Yeah. And you'll never be able to get that back. Right. They'll be done for the next four or five. Who knows? Whatever. So I just think in OKC, let's get it cracking. I mean, do, do you see San Antonio with the same type of trajectory mm-hmm. with their young guys? Yes. Really? 
Um, I think I I just think because I, I, I'm cause a conspiracy public, theorist. Public sentiment. This is not me. I don't watch enough. Public sentiment would say that Wimbyama has a Dean Smith situation where they said the only person to hold mm-hmm. Michael Jordan under 20 points a game is Dean Smith. Yeah. Public sentiment is giving the same energy towards someone on the Spurs team. Really? That's not worse than what uh, your man doing to Moody. <laughs> and put that on there because I, when I started breaking it down, that's full of shit too. Shout out to Curry, but that's crazy. I mean, you can I mean, you can only play with so many guys. We're we, we gonna cover them in a minute, so we can we can we can no, no, we can, no, 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 for sure. We but, can circle the block. No, you're absolutely right, but no, Wimby gonna be straight. G, I don't go against Coach Pop. Shout out, Coach Pop. I'm not talking about Coach Pop. Oh, who you talking about? They said Jeremy <laughs> Sohan don't pass him the ball. Oh, oh yeah, that <laughs> crazy man. <laughs> that man, that man, crazy. Yeah, don't. <laughs> That man is out of his mind. Shout out to Sohan. Like, but but I love this new era of Spurs. I do, I do too. And shout out to Pop. For transforming because you want to know what? Pop is letting them hope. So I'm like, I'm like, I don't see what y'all see because Pop would nip it in the bud if it was issue. So I don't think it's an issue. No, but also too, look at the culture. Yeah. Good for Pop for going with the times. Yeah. But look, bro, you're going from Wimby and Sohan. I mean, like you got Wimby and Sohan to now, like to back in the day, you had Tim Duncan, David Robinson, and freaking no lineup Tony Parker. Their haircuts was crazy. There was no sauce on that team. People used to be like, bro, I'm out here looking like a San Antonio Spur. Right, let's just move on from that. Wendy, I appreciate you. We on the team, bro. Let's get it. Point forward. My Warriors, they are making some headlines. They've been hooping mm-hmm. since since Draymond's got got back. Uh, my Warriors have made my Warriors made the headlines the other day. Oh, oh, that was a Charlotte game. I missed this part. All right. My Warriors, they made some headlines the other day for a scuffle that ensued at the end of the game versus. Grant Williams and the Charlotte Hornets. Shout out to Grant Williams. They 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 competing. No, nah, shout out to Grant they Williams. Competing. I want to touch on Grant Williams' pause later. They competing. They yeah. competing. No, they are. They are. I think Grant Williams is going over y'all heads in a certain instance, in my opinion. Okay, we can, we'll we'll we'll, yeah. we'll 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 figure that part out. I will touch on that. You can't say nothing no more around you. <laughs> no, I was gonna say we'll touch on that pause, yeah, and pause. I said we'll fill that out. Pause. Yeah, pause, bro. That shit matter, bro. I do go like grow up. You thirty five. I'm like, bro. If you hear what you say sometimes, I'm like, bro, this is aggressive. No, no punch. No punches were actually thrown in the scuffle. My young boy was part of that. Lester Quinones, uh, who was doing his thing. He's got some heart to him uh, from New York. So uh, my job wasn't affected too much, being that there weren't any punches throw. Uh, what was over some of y'all head is. That the good guys, quote unquote, have won nine out of the last eleven games. Well, we should say nine out of the last twelve. Yeah. We had a tough loss to Denver the other night, uh, which is a great sign coming down the stretch, heading to the playoffs. Um, and I guess the question is, are they primed for a deep playoff run? And history says yes. And here's why, as I read off some stats for everyone. During the 11-game stretch, they are third in the last 11 games in offensive rating and defensive rating, fourth in net defensive rating. And they say to make a deep run to, to have a chance to win it all, you got to be top five in offense and defensive ratings. Kaminga's been going crazy. I ain't got to speak on that. Y'all already know what time it is. We've been telling y'all for a while. Wiggins is finally catching his groove, doing his thing. He's attacking, finishing around the rim. And I always knew he was going to play well because like, he would just miss like little chips yeah. here and there. And I'm just like, okay, he right there. Like, leave him alone. Yeah, the just ball hit the back of the rim off a floater and yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Just like, yeah. Just, like, just like weird stuff. Uh, Wiggins just has some. He had a big night against the Lakers the other night. Um, you know you know who's been hooping, hooping, though? This kid probably got the most confidence in the league. Him and, him and Jeremy Sohan. They're probably competing for the most wavy dudes in the league. Brandon Pazimis, BP is what I call him. He's averaging 11 points, and now he's starting. And he's among the best rebounding guards in the league. He steals rebounds, but he's, he's got a knack for just finding the ball. He's always in the right places. Uh, you can tell he's always communicating. And from what I'm hear, hearing, he's challenging guys in practice. Like, he just got – He's got a lot of swag. It's like that uh, unreasonable confidence. But you got to have it. We always talk about that. And um, obviously, Steph has been Steph. Clay had 20 the other night in the quarter, went crazy. 
Uh, he had 35, the most points he's had all season off the bench versus Utah a couple weeks ago. Yeah, five, five threes versus, uh, in the first half versus uh, the Nuggets, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He was on uh, yeah, fire. Yeah, yeah. So, I think he had 20 in the first quarter. Yeah, I mean, what was the first half? First yeah, quarter, something first half. like that. But I mean, yeah. even with that, it took a 32 16 and 16 game from Jokic. Yeah. In a high altitude to really take out. No, I was in the Bay. I was in the Bay. Was in the yeah, bay. yeah, to take bay. out that team. You know what I mean? Bay. And and also Chris Paul, what he was doing for the bench, and I he, he was really had them like staying above water before he got hurt. Like he was really like one of the, I probably say one of the more impactful players on the entire team outside of Steph. He yeah. was doing his thing. So, um, well, Steve Kerr's quote was, "The goal is to avoid the play-in tournament, but the play-in is." Seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Yes. And uh, they're trying to jump ahead right now. I think they have Dallas. The next team in that sense is uh, Dallas. And they're like three and a half games behind back on Dallas, which is uh, – shout out to – people complain about Luka Doncic a lot, bro, but that West is tough, and he never falls below six. This is true. Like, like, and even as a rookie, he was in playoff. But like, we say, like, he don't try enough, but, like, dudes have to average triple doubles, so, like – Russell was averaging triple doubles to make certain playoffs. So, you know what I mean? It's like, Luka true. literally, even I think Damon said it at one point. He was like, man, shit, when I, when I was in Portland, we limp into the playoffs. But you look at Luka, Luka uh, good for two and a half weeks. Like, he like, shit, I can lose these last four. This and like, is true. And, and, and when you're breaking that in, you, you look at some of the playing games and the playing situations. And last year, they fell to, you know, the Lakers in the playoff situation and uh, the playing situation. But... How do you think you, you think they're hitting the right point to try to, you know, really jump up those spots and, you know, be a playoff team, not a, not a playing situation? But even if they are a playing situation, they're playing at a high level, say eight, they might like the first or second seed. If I'm a if I'm a first or second seed, I'm worried if I'm facing the Warriors or the Lakers first week. This is true. Yeah, this is Especially true. from the state yeah. standpoint of, like, how good the team is, but, like, just marketable. You look at last year, nobody watched the Thunder, I mean, the, the Heat versus Nuggets game. Like shit, I be free, I be calling the Nuggets of Thunder. That's how much unmarketable. <laughs> you know what I mean? You be like, man, who is he? Like, you know what I mean? Because you're you're looking for four or five main teams, and, you, and that's a tough team to match up against. Especially when we talked to Travis Valman earlier about the fifty point game seven that Steph can do or the, right. what Lakers can do. You know. Right. So the West is is so interesting. The Warriors do have to play Dallas three times. They got to play them three more times before the season's over. Damn, what, what so them games are going to be very, very, very important. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody's got to be – everybody's got to stay healthy. Wait, Kyrie going to be there? Kyrie will be there. Kyrie like the playoffs. No, I know. I'm just saying, if Kyrie going to be there with Luka and Luka go crazy and then Steph Kryptonite is who? Who do you think Steph's Kryptonite is? It's Kyrie. Okay. That's going to be it. It's going to be a really good – Steph, I don't mean that, game. G. I swear to God I don't mean that, bro. I just seen what I seen. You still the coldest dude, but I don't mean that. But Kyrie is unbelievable. Did you see how he finished the other night, bro? He could have finished on the right. He went up with the left hand, switched it to the right hand. I thought he was going to the right side. He still came back to the left side, flipped it, and failed. And then saw it all at the same time going. Bro, I posted it on my IG, but then I was like, why didn't that nigga just lay the ball up? <laughs> with his, why didn't he just lay the ball up with his right hand? It was special, man. So you look right now. Man, you got the Thunder and Wolves tied for first. You have the Nuggets tied. Oh, bro, that's tough. Yeah. If I was a Thunder or Wolves, I'd take me a couple L's. But the Thunder beat the Warriors three times this year. I totally did. Two one was fluky. Yeah, but playoff atmosphere, dog. Like, you going up against – one thing I say about the Warriors, bro, and I always tell you, and I hate them motherfuckers, G, y'all were, y'all were really polished, really good. And, like, sometimes new atmospheres, like, you forget how many – I remember Seth Curry said something after about to play y'all in the, in the Western Conference Finals. I'm sitting there, I said, yo, you was at 30 house last night, right? And I was like, you at you were at Steph's house last night? He's like, yeah, I'm like, he nervous, huh? It's like, nah, dog. I'm like, nah at all. Like, he's just shot 38% last and we kind of hot. 30 seen a lot, bro. And when I broke it down, when you break that down, bro, it's an understatement, bro. And that's why I think the two teams, like the Timberwolves, who are still young and still sporadic, that's a scary thing to go up against a Braun. Right. You, and then when you go, like you said, the Thunder. A.K.A. the Nuggets. That's a scary thing to go up against the Beige Boys, bro. Yeah, but I don't know, man. Shea bringing back dark Ooh, skin dudes. I forgot about what he did to do. My fault again, Steph. I had to pull up on him and ask him. I pulled up on Shea. Hey, man, don't be doing that. 
He said, what I do? I said, don't be posting stuff on your Instagram like that. He was like, man, I don't want to wake up no no monsters, you, man. I don't want no smoke. You want to know who, you want to know who sent that shot? It's Chris Paul. <laughs> Chris Paul, yo, do that to that. <laughs> do all that to buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's what it happened. He gave him the game plan. How George Carl said you be doing? <laughs> that's how CP be doing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. Let's uh. So, shoot, we talking about, you know, I know Steve Curry's trying to worry about making it, you know, out of playing games, but we're trying to see the odds of, uh, you know, the odds of the Warriors making it to the Western Conference Finals and the NBA Finals. I mean, the odds are, the odds have been interesting. They moved even from two, three days ago uh, to make the playoffs. Uh, yes is at a plus 105 and a no is at minus 130. Means not making the playoffs is a slight favorite. Interesting. That's, I, that's a lot of betting. I think a lot of folks would bet one way or the other on that. And to participate in a play-in tournament, they're at a minus 1,100. To make the Western Conference Finals, they're at a plus 700. To make the finals, they're at a plus 1,800. To win a title, this is where I saw it move. It was at a plus 4,000 not too long ago. Now it's at a plus 3,500. And they found a, they found somewhat of a groove. That... That Denver game was interesting, though, because the Warriors were hitting on all cylinders early. And I look up, they only up six at the end of the first quarter. Then they go up like 16 in the second quarter. Then they go in the half, the game is tied. And then I'm thinking game over. Yeah. I knew game was over. Yeah. Well, you want to know what's so crazy that people forget? We talk about Jokic. I mean, when you play yourself, nobody even brings him up in Murray. Jamal yeah. Murray is, whenever he's activated versus a top five team, he's arguably a top ten guard. Am I wrong for saying that? Yeah, it's him. It's someone else, too, that I don't think he gets enough credit. Aaron Gordon. When he plays his Unbelievable. role. Unbelievable. You know why? He's too when, big, too, You know what bro. I saw? Yeah. The way he guarded Kaminga, yeah. he does that on a nightly basis. Yes. Kaminga began 20 at will yeah. the last two months. Yeah. At will. Aaron Gordon has been guarding the hell out of the basketball for the last couple years, and mm. I think it just goes unnoticed because of just the the greatness of Jokic and the greatness of Murray. And and Perk said it; he thinks they're the best two man tandem in the league. Yeah, and Murray. When you talk about Murray, bro, and I've seen it like firsthand from like the playoffs. It's not like it's Murray getting twenty three. Murray is getting thirty three yeah. and nine. He's just not getting thirty eight and eighteen like it's big. Right. But every big game. He's, Coming out, man, that, that little motherfucker cold, yeah, he, can go. he can go. Him, Shea, for Canada? Yeah, I don't know what Canada's missing. Man, shit. They better not. If they, and then they Lou got, Dort? They got Lou Dort. If they, shout, shout out Canada. Bro, if y'all can't do shit in the next five to ten years, please shut the fuck up. <laughs> and stick to hockey. Because there's some more guys we're not even talking about. There's yeah. a bunch of guys. No, that's on that's Kelly O'Lennon. Kelly, yeah, yeah, Kelly. We we got the uh, Shea Gill just out of there shooting ass. Uh, the Canadian version of Jordan Clarkson. Uh, it's a little boy named Nikhil Alexander. Nikhil, Nikhil, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, a bunch of them. We forgetting some guys. No, they cold, bro. Joseph, Corey, jo- all Corey them, bro. Joseph. Yeah, but they yeah, have a yeah. solid team yeah, that should be right. making a run. Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit five dollars or more can get a no sweat bet up to one thousand dollars back in a bonus bet. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code POINT4. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code POINT4. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit cpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. One no-sweat bet per new customer. Issued as one bonus bet on amount of initial losing bet. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash promos for deposit, wagering, and eligibility restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. Point. Forward. Our next one is uh, our newest segment that we've been having. It's Heard Them Say. Um, this is where we, you know, check the streets, kind of keep our ears to the ground, hear what y'all been saying and some of the rumblings. And um, we got a couple of different topics. And obviously we brought up Wimby. We talked about what he did the other night when he mm-hmm. got five steals, five blocks. Yeah. So it's five steals, five blocks in consecutive games. Only Wimby. Oh, in consecutive games. Yeah, only Wimby and MJ have done that. 
So it took one beat. MJ done that back in 1987. Mm-hmm. So when we argue this GOAT conversation, it took a 7-4 freak to do what MJ did, I guess, years ago. 35, well, however many years ago. 36, 40-something years ago. That's crazy, bro. That's uh, wavy. I mean, this kid has the potential to be really, really, really good. And I hope they, I hope, I hope we were able to appreciate it because we live in this era of instant gratification where we don't appreciate our greatness the way we used to because we're so familiar with it. We see it every day. And it's just like, I'll just hope we appreciate it because because he's, he's different. When I seen him roll his ankle and pop back up and keep going, I was like, whoa, like he, he – like he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing. I can't believe he's seven four moving like that, and he's really that tall. Like yeah. when I met him, I'm talking like I've never spoken to someone like this, like straight up. So last week, Dre, obviously you're head of the union, but you notice your your job picks up a little bit anytime there's scuffles that occur. Like you said, there was no punches thrown in the Hornets versus uh, Warriors game, but even during that week last week, they try to say the NBA is soft, but last week we had three different type of brawls. You got Dennis Schroeder versus Mike Conley. I can't believe that. Mike, Mike Conley's never got a tech in his entire well, career. Well, Dennis pushed him, you know what I mean? So it kind of calmed it down. Then you had, obviously, the, the Warriors, Hornets, Mayhem. And then, uh, remember the Heat Pelicans, Thomas Bryant and... Uh, oh, that was crazy. Uh, Jose Alvarado. Yeah. I'm pun- watching the scuffle, and then I'm like, wait, what's going on? I'm I didn't like, even why, see the... Yeah, why would a seven-footer punch a six-footer? You know what I mean? What do you think about that, bro? Heat that, culture. That, that, I guess so, bro. You know what? It's all about how you present your product, and I think we just have to understand that. But at the same time, I think um, you can't have sport without emotion. Yeah. And I'm, I constantly try to reiterate that to those that are in position of uh, on the financial side of the game. And so they're trying to extract every dollar they can out of the game, and they don't understand – the complexities of being an athlete or how your emotions can are involved in the game of what you love to do. Like you want guys to play really hard every single night. You want them to, to you know, go out there and dive at every basketball. You want them to like die on a sword. Like I do whatever it takes to win. Isn't that the story they tell? Yeah. But your emotions going to take over as some, sometimes whether it's with an official or that's with, against your opponent. That's just how we're built as athletes. But that's, all, that's also why there's only but so many of us. And so I, I've always had a, issue with how they want to portray the game as this perfect peaceful game it's like no you're going to have tussles now yes you do need to have accountability in place to make sure people ain't just going out there you know wild and reckless but like a lot of these things like it's just like like the Schroeder Conley thing I just saw it like no big deal keep going even the Warriors Hornets situation you know and so I think back in the day in the league it was more or less like like we didn't, they didn't even have games on national TV. Like it was tape delay finals, and so they were seeing everything more. Like yeah. even on NBA TV, when you're watching the games, it's like man, you can see people acting a fool on the bench. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, and it, and it was a part of yeah, your skill set. A part of the skill set was your toughness. Yeah. So the power force position was just hitting people. Yeah. Like an enforcer, like an enforcer was real. Like they got it in hockey, which is like that part is funny to me too. So when some like every sport has their enforcer, and it feels like basketball just taking that. It just stripped that part of the game away. So I don't think we're soft. It's just the way the game has the game has changed because of how we want to present it to the viewer. That's all it's about. Yeah, I remember uh, I always joked, and I was talking. To, I was in Boston one time, and we were talking to. Uh, we were talking about the difference between like toughness, and they were trying to say hockey guys are tough. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, but like not really. But I was like, if it came, like we would beat the shit out of every last one of those hockey dudes. And now if you call it tough with them just getting their ass whooped, cool. But I guarantee everybody in here would not be injured. So you tell me tough or not. But but there's nothing tough about they hit each other 28 times. Them niggas hitting like bitches. Yeah, but they hit like bitches, bro. I'm just joking. Now, shout out to the hockey players. Shout out to my guy, David Postra. Postra Knack from the Bruins. You remember back in Bijou, I saved your life because that one local street nigga is going to do you in. Shout out to the uh, Celebrinis from Canada who will be uh, future uh, NHL Hall of Famers. They're not there yet. They're, one's number one next year, and the other one's coming the year after that. And shout out to Bedard in uh, Chicago. I know I don't know you, but um, you holding it down. I'm going to jump the bandwagon, go get your jersey um, in a couple years, like I did when Patrick Kane and them won a couple Stanley Cups back in the day. Point. Forward. First off, man, this is my favorite week of uh, That's a Bar. Y'all should already know her, 
But who we bringing up right now, man? We can bring it up the young phenom from Notre Dame, the freshman phenom, Hannah Hidalgo, uh, Coach Ivy's point guard, star player. You know, just right now, she's went on a 12-game stretch that has never been done before. She's the only player in Division One NBA and WNBA to have a 12-game stretch that consists of 280 points, 70 rebounds, 70 assists, and 70 steals, dog. 70 steals in a 12-game stretch. Oh, wow. 70 steals in a 12-game stretch. Yeah, so that's like five and a half steals, bro. You can you can five point two. Yeah, five you probably two. you can really only need four players. She getting seventy steals, bro. She covering a team's worth it. Hannah Hidalgo. I know we listen to Ju, Juju Watkins. The bun is the coldest. Caitlin Clark, the coldest. But we're watching right now, bro. Go watch the Notre Dame game, bro. The truth, bro. I don't even know. People must not want to get to South Bend or something, bro. She's a killer. Bro. Notre Dame always have great guards. They always, bro. This, they had uh, this is Skyler, dumb. bro. This is dumb. And then they had... Orique. Yeah, Orique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She yeah, cold. Yeah, yeah. More of finest. Yeah, she, she cold. She can go-go. She cold. But, bro, this is crazy. If you ever get a chance, go watch her, bro. 70 still sounds crazy. Yeah. And it reminds me of this story. We're watching film. And Pete Myers, uh, Chicago Bulls legend, uh, he filled in for Michael Jordan during a, when Michael Jordan retired the first time. It's the truth. And uh, he's from uh, Alabama. Alabama Pete. Cousin Pete. And he, we watching film. And he said, uh, Tony Douglas, <clears throat> Tony Douglas, this is the greatest defensive performance I've ever seen. <laughs> so I'm thinking, this is a good clip. So he's like, look at this. Everybody watch. Tony Douglas, guarding the ball. On the ball, pressure the ball. Ball comes up the court. Goes into the post. Tony Douglas, he guarding the post now. Ball gets swung cross court. Tony Douglas guarding him. Pick and roll. Tony Douglas switch. That ain't your switch, but he switches. Then the ball goes out. Two people close out to the shout shooter. Tony Douglas closes out. In my history of basketball, the last 50 years that I've been in basketball, I've never seen one player guard all five players. <laughs> you broke every principle we teach. <laughs> But he started off, I thought he was finished on love. Like, oh, you going to get some playing time. Like, <laughs> yeah. my deal now. He said, I he never. Broke every principle. We I never seen a player go all five players in one possession and break every def- defensive principle that we teach. Man, that was the funniest thing Bro, ever. Bro, that reminds me of when y'all made us go watch two live story that one day. Remember? <laughs> Which one? Oh, it was one on Snapchat. It, I remember I went through like 20 snaps. But at one point, I go back to the chat. I look up the Billy Madison thing. When he told a story about the dog again, he was like, that was by far, unequivocally, one of the worst answers I ever heard in my life. You were better off just by saying, I know. That's what it sounds like when he told that. Like, you took them all around. But he said, you guarded all five positions. You literally broke down everything we taught you. I would have left right after that. <laughs> That's how you know you're not on the team. I tried so hard. But I'm like, Pete, you just got me f- cut. <laughs> I'm like, what? Point forward. This week, we have Sacramento shooting guard, former Maryland Terp, and good friend of ET's, Kevin Herter, joining Point Forward today. Evan, do you have any anything you want to share about Kevin before we dive into this? I absolutely do. I want to give like a little uh, disclaimer. Sometimes, you know, bro, the wrong nerd grabbed the, t- the the phone. Now you get the wrong reputation. You know what I mean? The guy coming to this show is a thorough one, a real one. He already got it, bro. He's in tune. He's been outside. He's been on the porch. You know, every time I pick up the phone and call him, he responds. I always had a thorough, you know, disposition. I'm always appreciating him. But this this kid is talented. He's going to have a lot of uh, bright future. And if, uh, you know, after the interview, check out some of his highlights, bro, because what he's able to do in such a short career is uh, unbelievable. True story. Did, did he, was he fortunate enough to get a wedgie? No, I didn't give Kevin Herter, by that time, um, you are going to get in trouble for, for bothering rookies with the Hawks for whatever reason. So, to be honest with you, I really just had regular conversations with Kevin, and that's where we joined, uh, we joined Cahoots. But I'll say this, in that locker room, one thing, every time I would try to come around him and kind of like, you know, play around with him, play him like a, play a joke on him. You kind of had to stop because like, no, nah, he's like this one of them. You know what I mean? I'd be like, nah, this dude, he he ain't even along the lines of like three, and it wasn't like picking on. It's just like, nah, he's a thorough dude. So. 
Yeah, so I got some coffee because it's early in the morning on, on, the, on the West Coast. And uh, the league has been this color, but y'all have done an amazing job of keeping the standard very high with your skill set. And, you know, y'all starting to breed some tall guys and y'all starting to get y'all workouts. Y'all workouts are – y'all got some high flyers now. Mac McClung, two-time champ. Y'all throwing some cream into it. So it's all love. You know, y'all doing y'all thing. And then uh, I think with Steph and Clay being very, very fair-skinned, um, you know, y'all just being able to blend in. I want to definitely dive into that in terms of how that uh, Atlanta team was kind of constructed uh, in terms of, like, who would be the next Steph and Clay, um, And then just kind of how you come along in your career, you know, being traded is difficult at a young age and being able to uh, be mentioned by Kevin Durant, we definitely want to dive into it. But you definitely represent for the cream. And so we showing mad respect, mad love, and appreciate you jumping on this good whatever day it is morning. Andre, before oh, we yeah, get going, I have, to tell you two, I have to tell you two of his nicknames. When I got to Atlanta, when he, they were calling him Kavan, not Kevin, Kavan and Red Velvet. Like, that's how much <laughs> shit he had to his game. <laughs> Why Kavan? I mean, because he said he Kayvon. played like a they black dude. It. He had some Kavan. <laughs> oh, I like it. That's a compliment then, right? Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah, explain explain to people when when how how our compliments work. Oh, they're they're, they're basically backhanded compliments, but we we, ba <laughs> we basically just say the obvious. It's just super inappropriate. But it's a term of endearment. Is that that's, yeah. that's our theme? Terms of endearment. We take something that is negative connotation and we turn it into a brotherly bond. Take what I can get. Yeah, so I'll take it. Yes. So, you know, Kevin, obviously we've known you for a minute. Of course, uh, you know, big time basketball fans know you, but go out and explain, you know, who Kevin Herter is for the casual fan and, uh, you know, what they might not know about you. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I grew up in upstate New York. I, I tell everybody I'm from New York and they and they light up thinking I'm from the city and I get the letdown period of like, nah, I'm actually I'm from two hours north of that. Uh, so I'm from Albany, New York. Uh, I went to school at Maryland. I was there two years. Uh, first year made the NCAAs. Our second year we didn't, which was the year I came out. So I feel like I was flying under the radar a little bit coming into the NBA. And then I you know, spent four years in Atlanta. Uh, had an Eastern Conference run that kind of, I think, put me on the map, kind of put our team on the map. Mm -hmm. And then you know faced a little bit of disappointment that fourth year. Expectations were a lot higher and got bounced first round by the Heat. And I uh, got traded to Sacramento and... I think, you know, the casual NBA fan or really fans in general would followed our season last year, the light, the beam, all the gimmicks that came with it. And uh, now we're in year two in Sacramento, somehow crazy year six in the NBA. I uh, played with ET back in Atlanta. I think that was my second year that we were on the same team. Yep. Uh, so we know yep, each other played, for, I did it. for a little bit. <laughs> What's, what's crazy, though, is that I still see highlights. Like, they, for some reason, they, they keep showing when we played in L.A. Uh, our Hawks, would, I think Danny behind Green was back. on that team. He had the behind the back, the spin in the paint, got LeBron. I think that was when uh, no Solo didn't jump at LeBron's feet. That was like Danny Green had a tip dunk. They're trying to say, like, the crowd went. So, for some reason, I've seen a lot of highlights of you within the past couple of days of playing in Atlanta. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, your PT was a little up and down. We were trying to win that year, though. Know, it, so that was that was like a that was a yeah. No, I year. don't. At the, yeah, me neither. I wasn't tripping. It all played out how it was supposed to play out. You go back to uh, the Atlanta days, and one thing that I, I remember, uh, you know, seeing you first was when you got drafted. You know, in the same backcourt, same you know draft as a uh, Trey Young situation. And you know, I remember seeing you get drafted and being like, "Yo, there's a kid leaving after his second year from Maryland." And me and Dre joke all the time. We're like, I'll get shocked and be like, damn, a white dude left early. He must be good. And you talk about that process. <laughs> we had a conversation of uh, when you left early, you're just testing the waters. And you're just like, yeah, I, I guess I'll see what happens. When you showed up to the camp, everybody loves you. Can you go back to, you know, kind of accidentally stumbling into the NBA prematurely early on? Yeah, well, like I said, we didn't. Like, we didn't make the NCAAs that year. And, like, honestly, growing up, like, my dream was was to play college basketball. Like, I thought the NCAA tournament uh, was, like, a major deal. I really wanted to play in the NCAAs. That's what I grew up watching. 
And so like my college career, we lost first round my freshman year, my second year, we didn't make it. So like right away, I was kind of like after my second year, man, I'm, I'm trying to come back. We had a, we had a squad that was going to be coming back. We're supposed to be really good. And, uh, so I was like, I'm, I want to go back. And, uh, at the time it was really my, my dad, he, you know, we had people kind of talking to us like, Hey, Kevin should test the water, see how we see how he does, like kind of figure out where he's at in this process. And my dad wanted me to go it's like literally just to play pickup. Like he, he, we found out like there was a good chance I'd be invited to the combine. And he's like, you know, just go there and play against all the guys that are going to be coming out just to like mentally match yourself up and you know, use that as motivation for the next year. If you think you're close, if you think you're far, like, you know, just go there and kind of get that gauge. So I was like, all right, whatever. Like I'll, I'll go to the combine. And, um, like I, I tested super well, like all my, all my athletic tests I did really well in, uh, like the shooting stuff I did really well in. And then I, and then I played really well. I, I only had to play the first day. And so like, I kind of killed the combine. And so right away there was like a, it's like, yo, who's this guy? And did a couple workouts after that. And, uh, now it's, it's public knowledge. It wasn't at the time, but I got, I got promised by the Lakers, uh, after my workout with them, where that kind of solidified, they had the 25th pick and they kind of solidified like, okay, you're going to be going in the first round. And it's for me, I was comfortable. Like, again, I'll tell you like this whole process, I didn't want to leave college. Like I was, I was going through it kind of like in some ways hoping for the excuse of the reason, like, nah, you should wait a year and go back. And like everything, everything was like, you know, you're supposed to come out. Like this is your time. You're supposed to come out. And as you guys know, like, like, the timing of coming out of college some guys they go a year too early they wait a year too late like you really have to like go when it's your time and uh everything like the writing on the wall was that it was it was my time to leave from there you went right into atlanta you're able to partner up with trey young you follow up the following year and you get drafted you know they pick up two more lottery picks i remember coming in that year and seeing like shit it's going to be a battle because now you got trey who's for sure going to have the ball all the time and he loaded kevin herter pause with a DeAndre Hunter, Cam Reddish battle and matchup. Early on in your career, when you thought about that and coming out, how were you able to stay locked in and kind of rise above? Because it was three very talented players and you were able to find your niche there over, say that of a Cam Reddish and, you know, a young DeAndre Hunter. Yeah, it was. Like at the time, it was just the Hawks were trying to collect assets. So they... There was that uh the Trey and Luca trade where they got Cam's pick. So they picked Trey. They picked me later in that draft. Uh Amari Spellman was also picked in that draft at the Forgotten Man. Uh the following year they came in. He got traded to the Warriors. Got traded to the Warriors. Um got some yeah. stories about him. But so DeAndre Hunter was picked, I think, four, and then from that Luca trade, Cam was picked tenth. And uh you know, at the time, right away, I was like, you know, they picked two wings the year after I was drafted. I played a lot as a rookie. So right away, it was kind of like, you know, what's the plan here? And uh, but we're all so different. Like, I feel like we all if you, if you look at it big picture wise, like end of a game, you know, we could all be guys that could be on the court together. And so I know I could carve out my little niche. You know, I could find a way to get my, my playing time. And I respected those guys like they're all my age and I knew they're all super talented and really good. So it wasn't like a hating type yeah. of thing. It was all right. These guys are all good players. Now we're teammates and we'll, we'll figure it out together. And then the, the crazy part in it for me was then after Dre and Cam got drafted the following year, they traded for Bogdanovich, which for me, that was the first time that it was <laughs> like, all right. So like now they got some guy that does what I do. And so now there was four of us. Yeah. It was me, Bogey, Cam, Dre. You know, we had all played big minutes up to this point. Like the team was trying to push the chips to the center and start winning. And we did that year, which was kind of wild. Um, but that was the first time that year. I think it was kind of like, all right, like how's how's this all supposed to work out? I want to go back to how you grew up and how you, you know, you're known as one of the best shooters in the league. And when you came in, they compared you to Clay Thompson in terms of your not your games or people, but just shooting in general. You know, obviously there's a uh, premium. Uh, on shooting, you know, in the in the current climate of the NBA, uh, with the way you you know you all have developed a way of being able to knock down threes and the importance of the analytics around the three point shot, um, and so I always I used to always ask Clay, when did you know you were a great shooter? And so I'm posing you the same question: When did you know, like yo, like I don't miss? And when did you get the confidence, like anytime I shoot it, it's going in? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was it was really young. Uh, 
I had the luxury, like I had an older brother. And so my older brother, he was almost two years older than me. And so I always played up on his teams. And so like, I was always the smallest guy on the court, like growing up, it was, I had to play point guard because I was the shortest guy, but I could always shoot. Like that was, that was my value is playing with these older guys is, is I could shoot the piss out of the ball. And I think the first time it was kind of like, I, th I think validating outside of your local, like your YMCA or your local travel in your area, uh, we actually, and it's funny now, we still play against him. Um, we had, we went to a tournament, I think I was in like seventh grade. And we went and I was playing for City Rocks. Uh, we ended up, we went and played BABC and Terrence Mann was on that team. And Terrence Mann at this oh. point, Terrence Mann was a uh, Boston kid, but he was always like, you know, he was, he was always like tall and athletic and just like the best athlete on the court. And then I think when he got to college, like he slowed down growing wise and then you know, the rest of his game developed, but he was always just kind of like that guy's the best athlete on the court. And so we went, we played BABC and again, like I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet. And we were playing against this, this team that was super good. And uh, I think I had like six threes in the first half and they came out playing man and like I had six in the first half and they came out in the second half and like they played boxing one on me and Terrence was the guy guarding me. And so oh, wow. I remember and I think I, fin I ended up finishing with like like 20 something like I, I definitely slowed down in the second half and uh, we won the game. But I remember thinking at that point, like that was the first time respect wise of like, yo, I got the best at like. Like all of us knew who he was. Like you had this tall guy, like all the best athletes in the gym. And, and I'm like this little white guy, like getting boxed and won by BABC. And um, mm. I think that was the first time I was validating. But I think my, my whole life, just because I was always playing up, like my value to stay in the core was to shoot the ball. And so that's what I had to do. Mm -hmm. That's true. When you, after the Terrence Mann situation, did you go back to Albany and tell the homies like, yo, the, the most athletic black guy, had to guard me and shut me down in the jail. Like, did you, did you get some type of confidence? Like, yo, bro, I know one thing, we show up, we be nervous, but now I'm killing them. So I might be switching teams. I might not be hanging out with y'all no more. The brothers want me. <laughs> you, yeah. Well, all the, the thing we were talking about, honestly, was uh, Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown was also on that team. And the time, like, we thought okay. we used to call Bruce Brown <sighs> Russell Westbrook. Like, so Bruce Brown, again, same Makes age, sense. he was coming in like – dunking guys and so we had this like in our area we had this guy at the time he was like six nine bit like could barely move one of those like just the tallest guy in our area and he got dunked on bad by bruce and so that's when we came home for that tournament like telling everybody like yo marcus got banged on crazy by this russell westbrook looking dude like so that was what we were talking about um but it was by the time now, I think uh, nobody would have known Terrence if I talked about him, but uh, I think he remembers it because we used to play his teams a lot growing up. Yeah, well, during that time, too, people forget as well. You also played baseball and you played, uh, you won a state championship with two first round MLB players. Can you take us back to the day of uh, your baseball days and why you didn't take it pro there? That's where you guys uh, usually excel at. Yeah, no, I, I played baseball all growing up. And uh, yeah. it was honestly one of those things, you know, through my youth years, elementary, middle school days, like I played them both pretty equally. And uh, comparative to my basketball teams, to my baseball teams, like my baseball teams are always better. Like we're legitimate. We travel to these tournaments, even in, even our youth age, these national tournaments and and almost win them. Some of them went like our team was really good. We always used to play late into the summers. And so as I got older in basketball and individually, I started to basketball started to separate itself from baseball. Uh, I still wanted to play just because my age group, we had always been really good. And then the kind of the culmination of all that, my senior year, which was all the guys I'd grown up playing with, we won a state championship my senior year with that group. But uh, we always had a lot of fun. Like it was, you know, baseball for me is still something I follow the MLB, the Yankees, like every single day, I think I watch the Yankee games in the off season. Uh, oh, wow. So I've always loved baseball, but it was something that I wanted to stick with. <laughs> but AU season and our high school season started to conflict too much in high school, and I was like forced to make a decision. Okay, you're like you're either going to this, a this EYBL tournament on the weekend, or you got to stay back and play a game on a Saturday for your high school team. And that was kind of where the two started to separate. And and, and I want to jump back into. Uh... Unless ET, you want to follow with something similar because I'm going back to his uh, NBA. Career. Oh no, I was just going to ask: Was the side effect there like females didn't come to the baseball games? You just hoop because it was chicks at basketball games, <laughs> or were you like, man, shit, 
Like, what was the real decide? Certain people would be like, I love the game. Was there a different deciding factor? Like, the shorty's going to be here. It get too cold to hit in the spring. I'm straight. <laughs> it was honestly, I think it was a, it was a time thing. Like, I was definitely really good at baseball growing up. And then I think as I started to high school, like, my basketball for sure started to separate. And then... Yo, baseball is tough. Like you have to keep up with with hitting and and hitting in a cage. Like I actually like we had a little batting cage when I was growing up in our backyard, and uh, so I used to I used to practice it a lot more when I was younger. And I think as I got older, I just practiced basketball a lot more. And then all of a sudden, like when I was in high school, like I couldn't hit worth shit. Like my our senior year, I think I batted eighth with one of my best friends. Like I played center field every game. Like I was a great I was a great defender, but like. By the time I was a senior, I couldn't hit shit. Like once guys started throwing curveballs, like I was done, and mm. uh, so that was kind of my like that. That was very easy to make that decision. I carry like, man, I'm just I'm better at basketball. I might have more fun playing baseball. Like our team is cool, but like, like I'm better at basketball. I'll stick with this. Wait, wait. So, how tall were you your senior year? Yeah, I was I was six six five six six. So what's it like as a batter being that tall? It felt like that called it everything harder? strikes on me. Oh, for sure it's harder. Okay. Like the low strike, the low strike is tough. I mean, I was swinging through everything though. Like it really didn't matter. I was trying to pull everything. Uh, actually, the funniest story of all this though is I was a junior uh, getting recruited for basketball, and so John Beeline, obviously you guys know him. Uh, mm -hmm. He came mm -hmm. up. To, he flew up to Albany for one night to see me play baseball. Then I was supposed to meet with him after the game, and so. Like at this point in the season, I think we're like we're maybe eight games into the year. No exaggeration, I might have I might have three hits on the season. Like I'm like I said, I'm batting like seventh, eighth. This is my junior year, and like can't hit worth the shit. So he comes he comes to the game, and I like put one off the wall. Like the first at bat, he's sitting there. So he likes and he's standing left field. Like put one off the wall. I think the next at bat, like I hit a single. So in the game, I go like two for three with a walk, and so this guy's like. Yo, like, should I be talking to our baseball coach? Like, like is this gonna be a joke? Like, and I'm like, bro, you just saw my best game. Like, I'm, I'm not lying. Like, I can't play at Michigan. Uh, so it's like the one time somebody actually showed up. I played well. But like, little do you guys know, like, the rest of the season, I'm just like, I'm just a liability. I'm out here. Like, I can, I can defend pretty well, but I'm not hitting. Hey, I want. I want. That's that's so funny. And I and I was going to go to your, the rest of your NBA career, but um, I was a two two sport athlete. But I was. I actually thought about being a high jumper. Like I was like number four in the country. But mm -hmm. you got two guys on your team that uh, got drafted, right? MLB, right? Yep. What's it like playing with other pros in other sports in high school? It was. That it was it was a lot of fun to be in the same boat as both of them. So the two guys, Ian Anderson and, and Ben Anderson, they're twin brothers. Uh, Ian and Ben, I like all our youth teams. I was talking about like we played it with each other since I think we were literally seven years old. Like seven years old was the first time you go travel. And so Ian, when we were in high school, so he was taken fourth overall. Uh, so he was like a prodigy. Ben was taken. Ben went to college for three years and then he was drafted out of college. Uh, but Ian, when we were in high school, was you know, in terms of in baseball was more of a big deal than I was. And so in school at this point by our senior, year, like I was already committed to Maryland. So like I had my stuff set. And then as we came to our, the spring in baseball, our senior year, like it was, it was his time to show out as he's this, this, he was already projected first round draft pick, this and that. And uh, so he had a camera crew following him around our whole senior year. So we had, we had a, like a media company with us. Like we had MLB scouts coming every game, uh, like every every time he pitched, we had minimum eight scouts out there. Some games you had like 16, 17 scouts coming to watch him play. And so I think for everybody else around the school, like our school at this point had so much juice because you go from me in the basketball season having all these schools coming out watching us play to now we get to baseball season and all these scouts are coming out. Like the school just had so much juice around it. And so I think we could relate to each other, connect each other through that. Uh he, you know, we, we were mid season. We weren't even done with our season and he got drafted. Like he was, I forget the timing of it. It was either April or May. We were going through our playoffs. Mm -hmm. He had to go down to New York city, like missed a game, gets taken forth, comes back. And then he's pitching for us in the state championship. So like he had so much hype and juice around him that 
I think just being his friend growing up with him, it was great to see. But in terms of like the juice that was around our team, it was a lot of fun. That's what's up. And uh, one of the, the, the question that ET asked, you know, how did you pick baseball or how did you pick basketball over baseball? Was it the shorties? Led me to think, what was Evan Turner like as a teammate to you? <laughs> Well, here's I also throw this in there. Here, there's a very there's a very different girl that likes baseball players compared to likes basketball players. Like, and and you guys both know this. Like, Explain that. Explain that. We don't know. <laughs> I would have a lot of I would have a lot more. There's just a, as a white guy in the NBA, there's a different type of chick that that, that you know that likes NBA players, and I think there's a different demographic of of girls that generally like baseball players. So I think someone like myself. Now, all women love gingers. Would, uh, you think so? I, I know so. We, you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, like everybody, like you know, we're we do good. You know, everybody gets everybody gets attention. You're a pro, but you know, some of these baseball players or these these people that go to the games, I could tell you, there's certain girls that aren't into basketball players the same way. Uh, but Et Et as a player though, Et was, I mean, you you know, like Et was comedy. It was like every day you you didn't really. He was just we. I don't know if it's like self-diagnosed or it is diagnosed. Like, you know, like the ADHD, like the dude can't like, can't like relax. He, he's talking to everybody. Like he was everybody's best friend in the building. Uh, like coaches, like best friend, but worst nightmare just because there was times you didn't know if he was going to be locked in and like take it seriously. But he was, he was always a good pro, always did what he needed to do, got his work, got his work in. But like, if you would ask anybody on the team, all right, who's your best friend on the team? I bet you half of them's like Evan Turner, like probably that guy. It's like good energy, you know. No, no, I know, yeah, I know. I mean, you need confidence your, in Randy, yourself. It was hard to take you know anything to to. serious because we were getting the shit kicked out of us. This is what about Atlanta. Ass beat. These dudes would go out, play a bulk of the game, lose by thirty. They'll put us in the last four minutes. We'll show up the next day. They'll have like an off day lifting weights while we're running plays. So at one point. I'm like, bro, I'm into everything, bro, but you got me fucked up, uh, Slinky. What's his name? <laughs> Travis Slinky. I'm like, bro, Slink. you don't decide. And, Travis and Slink. I, yeah, I believed in, like, the future because I knew they were all good. But at one point, it was like, bro, in order not to go crazy, I just got to laugh at this. And then even when it came down to it, to be a decent, like, not even a role player, like a good vet. It was like you had Chandler Parsons hating half the fucking time. And it was like, bro, how you going to hate on a group of 20-year-olds? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> It'd be like shit like also that. Was like, How you for hate maybe some... two weeks of that season. Yeah, yeah. The second he found out it wasn't going his way, he just dipped. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'll say who who else was with you with on that group? That was you, Chandler, because it was. It was like the vet crew, and then like like you said, we'd have kind of a light. Vince day and you guys would be Vince. That's oh, right. Vince. So <laughs> you, Chandler, Vince. And Alan Crabb, you guys would be having a light day. And I didn't want to tripping, but I'd be like, yo, this is this ain't how they play all the time. We don't play. They should probably be practicing harder. <laughs> like <laughs> not waiting for like two more years to be good. But I remember that team being really talented. I remember one thing about it was uh the maturity of Herder, how he really played. He understood the game. But uh I think a lot of times we joke around with people, you know who's uh Thinks at a different level, and every time we had a conversation, I was like, "Oh, this this kid, you know, really knows something." And and obviously, you can kind of tell who's going to stick around a lot. So when that that game seven happens in Atlanta, you know, obviously when we, I leave the team, and next year you guys go to the Eastern Conference Finals, there was nothing shocking when you know he goes to Philadelphia and puts up twenty seven in the game seven and takes him to the Eastern Conference Finals. What do you remember about that situation and those games as well? Stepping up in your first playoffs, and many people not expecting much, but you shocking, you know, you guys shocking the world. Yeah, that was kind of the key. Like, nobody really expected us to do anything. And that was the prototypical, like, a team got hot at the right time. Like, we had a makeup of just shooters. Like, the, the only people that played in that playoffs was Trey, myself, Bogdanovich, Gallinari, with John Collins, Clint Capella, and mm -hmm. a little bit of Solomon Hill. And so, like, you know, the playing group of that, because DeAndre was hurt, Cam Reddish was hurt, and, like, we just kind of just start to shoot the piss out of it. Like, we, we throw lineups out there with Trey, Bogey, myself, Gallo, and Clint. Clint's guarding four people, and the rest of us get to shoot, you know, bomb threes on offense. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. I think 
I think winning that Philly series was uh, that was a culmination of all of it. But like I remember Philly that year, like they're the number one seed. You could tell they thought we were gonna, and and I know this for a fact. They thought they're gonna sweep us, and then we win game one. And they're like, all right, like gentlemen sweep. They got one, but like, like they did not respect us. They thought they're gonna roll us, and so like the the further that 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 series went, and you know the all of a sudden you get to five games, to six games, then game seven. Like you could tell doubt started to creep in. Like they're like, how are these guys beating us? Like we're the number one seed. We don't even know who half these guys are. They're smaller than us. You got Trey Young as our best player, and he's. We're double teaming them every time down the court. Like, uh, we get to game seven, and um, you could tell when the wheels fell off. Like, I think we were, Gallo had a dunk that put us up five or six with 30 seconds left. And I think the next possession, they started throwing stuff on the court. And then we get to the free throw line, and we're shooting free throws. And you got who Tobias is my guy, but Tobias starts bitching at the ref. Joel starts, he turns around, he's bitching at the ref. Like, somebody else, like, you could just tell, like, everything was crashing and burning and uh mm -hmm. and ben in that series ben was up to that player ben was an all-star in this league and hasn't quite been the same and so like you could tell just like there was a changing of the guard that year in that series and it's such a fulfilling even to this day feeling of beating them in their building uh and then taking milwaukee to six games and almost taking them down yeah i, I want to yeah. dive into that in terms of your the mentality of an nba player and how you've grown throughout your time in the league. Going through series like that, seeing what's happening to other guys, you know, how do you take all those things and learn from it for yourself moving forward? Because I, I wanted to talk about being traded and what's that, what that's like and how you got to constantly keep your confidence in the world that we live in. You know, how, how have you matured as a basketball player in the NBA? Yeah, like the and you guys know, like a playoff series is so much different than a regular a regular season game. Just uh, the intensity of it, the focus level, the scouting reports, and how the game is played, the physicality of it, and so it's just a massive step up. Uh, and so that was our first experience in it that year. And uh, now for me, I had a couple more playoff series. I haven't won a series since that year. We lost to Miami, and then last year lost to this lost to Golden State. Um, but I think you learn a lot about yourself as a player, you know, what you know, what you can do to stay on the court in those. Like, you really need, for me, like, you, all the players that play during the playoffs, I feel like have an elite skill. Like, what's going to be your reason for staying on the court? You obviously have to play both sides of the ball. Like, if you're any sort of defensive liability, you can't be on the court because they're going to seek you out and, and pick you apart every time. But – like you have to have an elite skill, I feel like to to have success at that level. And uh, you know, I feel like that first playoff series was you know, I was coming off the bench a little bit. I was aggressive, but then really started to shoot it well. And that's kind of always been my thing. We go back like when I was younger, and I stayed on the court playing with my older brother and my ability to shoot the ball. And so, as much as everything else around me changes, and and learning different skills and trying to be a better rebounder, defender, this or that. Like as long as I. As long as I shoot threes at a high clip, I have, I have confidence in my ability to stay on the court. I like how, uh, Kevin, you're able to – I was there when you – obviously you guys were doing a rebuild. You were able to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Something's very, very tough to do. And then you're traded off to another rebuild situation. What was your mentality and mindset like going over there? Because you know how tough it is to kind of restart. But you jumped right in, had the best year of your career. Points-wise, you averaged 15 points per game. Then you shot 40% from the three. And even was an NBA, you know, three-point participant. What was your mindset walking in over there? And, and how were you able to start a new chapter and get buckled in so easily? Yeah, that was, you know, Sacramento uh, in our lifetime, 16 years in my lifetime, I've never really seen him win. You know, I was super young during those Peja teams and Chris Webber. And so, I, like, growing up, the Sacramento Kings weren't weren't a cool team to root for just because mm -hmm. they, hadn't, they hadn't won. And so – yeah, I think when I got traded, I was, I was pretty scared right away. I was like, oh my god, like I just got traded. I just got traded across the country. I don't know anything about this team. I don't know who they have. And then, you know, as it kind of started to continue to make moves, you, the, you know, the the roster that we have took shape, and you could look at it and be like, all right, like you know, this, this team has a lot of has a lot of promise. Like they're making moves and had traded for Domas before I got there. Fox was already there. Brought in me and Malik Monk. Harrison Barnes is, is already there. Uh, you know, at that point, didn't know they are going to be drafting Keegan Murray. At this point, they're like, oh, they have a, 
actually he was drafted before I got there. Like, you know, I have a, have a fourth overall pick at Keegan Murray. And so yeah. you know, Davion Mitchell, I knew from, you know, a national championship, national champion at Baylor. So you're like, all right, like, this roster isn't that bad. Like this, you know, we got some guys here and guys who have, have won in other places. You know, I played against Domas, played against Harrison, played against Malik and uh, always thought Fox was unbelievable going back to, to our high school days. And so right away I was like, okay, like they got some bringing Mike Brown. And then, you know, we kind of hit the ground running. We lost our, we actually lost our first four games of the season and then went on a winning streak and just kind of got hot and stayed hot and, you know, the NBA loved us. Our home fans loved us. But I think initially I was definitely I was definitely scared of what was happening. You know, moving across the country to a team that hasn't won right away can can be a negative thing on your career. And I feel like I'd built a lot of momentum in Atlanta and you know, establishing myself as as a good young player in this league. And you want to keep that momentum, obviously, and, and continue to build and, and have success in this league to stay in the league. And uh didn't start out great, but I think you know, the more I looked at it and, and calmed down a little bit, it was I was really optimistic for what we had here. What did that trade teach you about the business? Because when you signed that four year deal, after the year you had, I thought you were going to go get at least eighty to a hundred million. And I remember reading an article and you were like, No, this will be good enough for me. I understand sixty five million is enough money. But now understanding the business and what you've done, how has your mindset changed? as a as a businessman in regards to your career much more than like a college approach of like well i'll be good no it is like this this league is it is for sure business uh yeah i um in atlanta you know they you know, the ownership there is they're around the team they're very involved uh tony has has you know, Tony Ressler, he has meetings with the team, business meetings. He's in the building. Like yeah. uh, Jamie Gertz is at every game. You know, they're they're a very hands-on ownership group. You know, they have three sons that are around the team, and everybody kind of gets to know them. And so I think they're like I felt I felt comfortable. Like I was, you know, I was drafted by them and had been to dinner with a couple of them, and uh, you know, invited to invited to people's weddings, and and I think like it's not like I felt untouchable, but like, okay, like this is, you know, this is a family type atmosphere and we're building something here. And I was at the ground floor of it. You know, the first draft, I was in Trey's draft at the start of this rebuild. And, uh, not that I felt I could be traded, but like, if we're going to trade somebody, like I, I'm, I'm not the guy that will be. And then yeah. boom, and then boom, you're traded and you, and it's, and it's all like, okay, like this is a business. And, uh, you know, the year before yeah. going through my contract negotiations, I remember just always thinking like, yeah, you know, the difference between 65 and 70 is not much, but the difference between 65 and 10 is everything. And so you hear all yeah. these like the horrible stories of different guys in the league. I don't need to say their name of passing up money, trying to bet on themselves and then losing out a lot of money. Like I, at the mm -hmm. time I was like, I want to make sure I get it first. And then, you know, maybe yeah, I could take a little right. bit more of a, a risk on my on my second contract, the one that's coming up, and maybe say no and go to free agency yeah. or you know wait on negotiation. But like the first one, I'm not going to sit here and, and cry over loose change between 65 and 70. Like just take your 65, swallow your pride, and, and sign the dotted line. Um, and so then, you know, I signed that. I was really happy about it. But in terms of like the NBA being a business, like you come here and. You know, I leave an ownership group in a, in a place that I'm comfortable with and thinking I'm family, and then you move out here and uh, front office, same way. Front office has been great, uh, really close, and, and have a lot of close teammates. And it's it sucks because it's you know for me that it's happened two once. It's it sticks in the back of my mind. Like you know, this isn't something that that's forever. Like it could be, it might not be, but you can't like plan for mm -hmm. it to be. And so you kind of yeah. got always. It sucks, but you're like you got to look out for yourself in a lot of ways. And also, too, you look at the levels. You say you got you got drafted with Trey Young, and say you got drafted with Trey Young. Between those two guard draft courts, they spent two hundred and seventy million. You know what I mean? Or like a on a you know on a salary. So then when it comes down to it, and I, I wasn't saying anything bad because you look at Dre. Dre turned down sixty five million his first time to go get eighty four. You know what I mean? So I was just always wondering if that was like a teach all one moment situation because you know i always look sometimes of uh how that front office would you know try to build a fan i always love the atlanta front office don't get it wrong i remember used to sit there but like, okay just be wary it's still a business so we're getting invited here there and a third you bought a house and got moved the fuck out a year later 
and then they gave your yeah. counterpart three and a half more than what you got. Right. You know I, mean? I know. Like that's it is like for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying that like we we're getting invited to do everything everything was great i did i bought a house and got traded i think eight months later um mm. but it is it kind of reminds I mean, you like it is it's like a teaching niggas. point like <laughs> right <laughs> like it was a teaching point though like the first time it happens now i'm like all right now i know like the rest of my career it's like this is kind of what it is and don't be surprised if it happens again you got to kind of you got to save yourself a little bit uh what have you changed recently in terms of your preparation or your mindset and what are what are some goals for you going forward um, as you're you know reaching the middle of your career yeah i mean i think you know it's good moving to sacramento that's different from atlanta you know sacramento is pretty easy to lock in when you're here and uh become a really good basketball player and so you know year six in the league i think you learn different things along the way i think for me the routine is everything trying to stick and be consistent with your lifting your treatment your recovery like there's so much of that that is uh it goes unnoticed but over the course of a season like you need to keep up with everything and so uh even your work like your on-court work it's it's figuring out your own routine your own schedule what works for you and then the best you can trying to stick with it through wins through losses through back-to-backs through uh through all-star weekends or all-star breaks like you know it's really the best you can do and, and stay in the course and staying even keeled and trying to avoid the the peaks and valleys of a season the best the better you're going to be and uh I think that's kind of my focus here. You know, we're, we have a team that uh, on some nights I think we can beat anybody, and then we, you know, we've lost to the, the Detroit Pistons and the Washington Wizards at home, both of them this year. And so on, on different nights we can get beat by anybody. And so, uh, Which I just, I just beat Denver before the break. We've beaten Denver three times this year. Like that's the type of stuff like it doesn't make sense. You know, if, if you had asked me today who's the best team in the league, I'm saying Denver or the Celtics, and we've beaten one of them three times. But – like I said, we've gone the other way, and Port- Portland beat us by 20. Uh, Detroit beat us, almost beat us twice, and then the Wizards beat us. You know, it's like we kind of got to figure some stuff out here. But we have a talented group, a group that I think can beat anybody. Mm-hmm. We just got to figure out a way to get more consistent. But uh, we'll see. The West is tough. Like, you get into a playoff series, I have a lot of confidence in us, but everything has to do with matchups for sure. For sure, especially in the West. Especially yeah, you guys West. play versus the Warriors. In uh, you know your first playoff series out west, what do you remember about that series? That was a hell of a matchup series. It was a great first round series, but what did you learn from that? They should have won. You, know, you can really you know <laughs> really won. take back for the second year because when you if there's no Steph Curry born, that motherfucker's fifty points in a game seven like at the age of thirty five. Like what legacy do you want, yeah. big dog? Shit. Like why would he, why would he do that to y'all? But but talk about it. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that series for me also just – that just proved his greatness, like, in one series. Uh, you know, we – like, our game plan in that was – he was 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B on our scouting report. Like, everything was geared up, like, how can we try to slow this guy down between coverages and trying to throw different bodies at him to, okay, if we think this is going seven games, we need to try to wear him out by game seven. And, and – like every game, he just answered the bell. Like it was, he was playing 35 plus minutes a night. You know, his shot making was at an all time premium. Uh, and then game seven, the culmination of it, where we're at home and we just went a big game six on the road and he comes out and gives us 50. Like it was, I think that for me, looking back, it just proved his greatness and you see it firsthand. And then just in general, like that dynasty, you know. Like, if, if you ask me, even to this day, like, I think we are the better team, but there's a reason that that team has had so much success. And, Andre, you know, so much success in the playoffs. is like they just know how to win. Like, there's something about it. Like, those guys, when, when push comes to shove, they just know how to how to win. And so, you know, that's – you know, it's a, it's a group that we've played a lot in the past two years. There's this little Northern California rivalry that has been a lot of fun. Um but I think if there's one thing I'll remember, it's the greatness of Steph Curry and then just in general, like why that team has been so successful for so long. And and right now, one thing I talked to Dre about, you guys were when the all star themes came out, you guys were six in the West. You uh obviously I'm a yeah. big Aaron Fox fan. You had uh DeMontis Sabonis, he was down there averaging triple double. Unfortunately, you guys didn't have any all stars. 
And I'm wondering, what do you think it'll take in order to continue to change the narrative and gain that natural respect of what you're doing as opposed to like a flash in a pan? And what did you learn from your Western, your, your first year in the playoffs with Atlanta and how to bounce back that next year? What's the difficulty? Yeah, know? like it's, as much as you want to sit here and, and like they're both my teammates. I think they're both very deserving of being in that all-star game. They're both all-stars last year. We're virtually the same team that we are this year than last year. But the West is the West is loaded, first of all. Everyone's healthy, second of all. And like you look at the roster of the West and who do you point to in the roster? You're like, okay, our guy should replace that guy. But you could for sure make the argument, all right, Domas is leading the league in triple doubles. Uh, he's six in MVP voting. And you're like, okay, it's Jokic, Anthony Davis, and then maybe Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns might be the guy that mm -hmm. you point to, but you know, the Timberwolves are number one in the West, and that guy put up, what, 70 this year, and he's having a tremendous season. So yeah. even him, like he can make mm -hmm. his own argument. Anthony Davis mm -hmm. is is going to be a Hall of Famer. It's, it's Anthony Davis. I think people want to see him in the All-Star game. Like he's just, he's a big name. Um, and so it's like, you know, I want to make an argument for these guys and my teammates, they should be there. But I think the circumstance of the season with how loaded it is and then everybody's healthy. Like last year, you take out Paul George, you take out Kawhi Leonard, those guys aren't in the game. All of a sudden there's, there's two open spots. And so, yeah, we just, I think, have to continue to, to win like that you know as long as you win i think everybody's going to get the accolades we won last year we we cleared house we got you know front office of the year had a rookie all team this or that we had three point guy we had two all stars we like yeah, coach of the year. staff of the year coach of the year like mm -hmm. everybody got awards because we won and so i think at the kings we still you know each and every year we're relevant and domas and fox are doing what they do like they're going to continue to be all stars every year or borderline and uh it just kind of depends on the season, but like the West is loaded. Like uh, uh, you know, that team and that picture, you could look at it. Those got a couple, those got a lot of Hall of Famers on that roster. Can you give us a difference between playing with De'Aaron Fox and playing with a Trey Young? Yeah, I mean, very similar in that. With friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. Both, uh, <laughs> both guys' ability to <laughs> big safe space. Both guys' ability to just take over the game, I think, is very similar. Uh, just elite scorers at the point guard position uh, are very similar. You know, I think, you know, for as much hate as that that Trey gets, like Trey goes in every game, and, and every team double teams him. Every team runs guys at him, and and you know, he's a guy that you have to pick up right when he gets over half court. And our playoff run, like, was in a large part due to the attention that he got, allowing other guys to get their open looks and their open shots to get going. Like, a lot of that started and ended with Trey. And so, mm -hmm. like, he's just a, he's an absolute menace on offense. And the guy that can take over your game and, and a guy that can break scouting reports. And uh, you know, similarly to, to De'Aaron, when I got here, like, De'Aaron went in that clutch, clutch, player of the year, clutch player of the year award last year. All that does for me is solidifies his ability to get a shot whenever he needs to. Like you go to you go to fourth quarters and and you guys know how this works. The last six minutes of the fourth quarter, when it's time to win, you put the ball in your best player's hands and you say, "Here, go, we're, we're going to get you maybe one switch. It's five out and go get us a bucket without us needing to draw play." And so that clutch player of the year, him being able to average. 12, 13 points in the fourth quarter is his ability to like, Darren, here's the ball. Here's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Go score. And he just did that time and time again last year and has ability to do it this year. And so uh, he's really unbelievable. Like, I think for me, he's a top three point guard in this league for sure. Uh, defensively, you know, they, I think defensively when he's locked in, he wants to be like his hands – and his ability to get steals and, and back tip it when he's guarding the ball or pressure the ball when he's on, like I know it's impossible to do as an NBA player, as an all-star for 48 minutes of a game, but he can just like, he can snap his fingers and he's the biggest flip a switch guy in this league when he wants to guard and he wants to, wants to put effort on that side of the ball and, and really try to lock someone up. Like he's, he's unbelievable. And so uh, I think that's the biggest difference is his ability to be elite, uh, to be elite two ways on the ball instead of, yep. uh, you know, for Trey, he's elite, elite on one side of the ball. And then the other side, I think a lot of it's just, you know, effort and, you know, what he's going to do game by game. But uh, Darren's a true head of the snake. 
Well, shit, Kev, we appreciate you, big dog. Thanks for coming through. You've been one of my favorite gingers on earth and one of my favorite, you know, honestly, one of my favorite players, even though we played together for, no, it's funny. Me and Kev only, we only played together for like three months, four months. We always had like great rapport, you know, a de pretty decent relationship. I was proud of you. The one piece of advice I gave you, you didn't listen to, which was amazing for you. Live your life. And, uh, you know, once again, we'll be checking you out. <laughs> Tuning in, and uh, you know, we'll check you on your podcast with your homies, the old Terps beyond the Big Ten. So appreciate you, old Terps. Yeah, I know. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys having me on. I've been uh, been trying to get on for a little while. All I know, you said you're one of my favorite gingers. I knew that there there's definitely a little line ahead of me, but appreciate you guys. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Let's do it again. No, no, for sure, for sure. And, and I'll be seeing you soon. As uh, I don't know, I work for you now. I hope you know that. So the more y'all that I can get involved, the better the league would be. Uh, you know, it, we had a record breaking uh, viewership on All Star Saturday night. We had 10 million chime in. Wow. And so uh, there's some amazing things we can do. You spoke about your second contract uh, coming up. It'll be after the TV deal, I believe. And so mm -hmm. you guys are going to be very rich. So I want you all to just continue to lock in, continue to pay attention. Um, I got to get you a part of one of my boards subcommittees that we're creating you can be you, you saw it you saw it and yeah. so uh as we build this thing out getting more of you guys uh involved and engaged it's y'all league and we're getting smarter right. we're becoming better businessmen and um you know you're going to be a leader you're a leader now and you'll continue to grow into your leadership and so just want you to bask and embrace it yeah you know as i start getting a little more hair in my chest i'll get more involved it's pa the first couple of years i was trying to lock in listen a little bit but now i've been around the block i'll uh Get more involved you, for sure. You don't need so, to know. Uh, yeah, you don't need to know much. It's a lot. Of, it's, it's, it's a lot of full of shit people on there. Just make sure you stay locked in. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of people that's on there. I'm like Drake. I gotta get involved. I'm like Drake. How the fuck is he on the board? How is this person on the board? <laughs> These are you're dealing with fucking idiots. But shout out to the gang because he wants to be. Shout out. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> well, what we're solving for, what we're solving for is so. Um, it's your league. And I understand what you're saying when you want to focus on your career and you got to get your footing right. Right. But you know how you would hear Kobe Bryant read the referee's manual. So he know how the officials were on the court or, you know, all you guys are reading the salary cap. All you guys are knowing what's going on in BRI. Are you know all you guys are reading the CBA? That's all you're doing. So you're just getting more in tune to what's going on with your game. And so it's yeah. not like you're st stepping away from it. You're just diving deeper into it. You just have to think of it from a different perspective. And so I just want you guys to be locked in on your business and you know, that your careers are really truly being owned by, by you all as a collective. It's true. It's true. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So I'll be seeing you at all the meetings. You have a I'll wonderful second half of the season. My man, you have a wonderful second half of the season, man. I'm, I'm really looking for y'all. Like, like last year was a great year. And the hardest thing to do is, you know, to prove out that, you know, you are who you think you are. So go in there and lock in. And uh, oh, yeah. get it done. Word. Well, I All appreciate right. you guys. Definitely will.